Okay, so we will pick up where we left off last week. And we were discussing major things here in the book of Daniel and basically the fact that you talk to any, quote, modern theologian almost, they're going to deny the book of Daniel, that it's even truthful. <laughs> but when you look at the book of Daniel, you see miracle after miracle and prophecy after prophecy. And that is why the book is so important. And that is why it is so constantly attacked and maligned by those that are claiming to be Christians in the church, but they're not. And that's what's weird. The attack is coming from inside the church. So if you're going to destroy the validity of the Bible, the book of Daniel just has to go because there's so many miracles, so many prophecies. And so Daniel needed credentials in this time that people might know that he was the man of God. And so God filled his life with prophecies, miracles, and even the pagan Babylonians would know he was the man of God. They tried to find a fault with him. They couldn't find one except that he was so committed to God and that's the key to this whole thing. Finally, even Nebuchadnezzar said, your God is the God. He's basically telling Daniel, okay, I agree with you. He's the one. Criswell said, there is not a liberal theologian in the world, past or present, who accepts the authenticity of the book of Daniel. They all deny its integrity declaring the book to be a blatant patent forgery. They define its contents as pure, unadulterated fiction. You know, well, I'll say this, that somebody wrote a book, of, of, wrote a, a fiction about that and put it on the movie screen, everybody would join the cult. Just because, <laughs> well, you know what I'm saying? They, they, yeah. they, they would all believe it, it could happen. Well, that's what's weird with the world nowadays. If something is connected with the Bible, is connected with God, it's going to be bucked up against right away. So, And Daniel becomes then a defense for God in not only in the time of Daniel, not only in the Hebrew nation, but it becomes a defense for us in this age. That's what's another thing that's important about it. Daniel was, had, was a defense for God in pagan Babylonian society and also for the very Jews in captivity. So this has been a constant message for God's people. Miracles and prophecy mean God is alive and active. And you should understand that because how did Jesus show people who he was? Well, through miracles and through prophecies. Same type of thing. Isaac Newton said to reject Daniel is to reject the Christian religion. So if somebody says, well, I believe in science. Well, you can quote Isaac Newton to him. <laughs> And so this is an affirmation that we're going to believe Daniel. And it's, it's just typical proof you find throughout the Bible. So we're going to accept what he says as God's word. Daniel becomes for us a home base for the affirmation of the authenticity of scripture. And that's important to understand. It's books like Daniel, Revelation, Zechariah that actually give total credence to the entirety of the word of God because of the prophecies involved in them. And Jesus himself believed in the book of Daniel. Jesus refers 
to sections from Daniel 5, 6, or 7 times in the Gospels. In Matthew alone, there must have been about four references to Daniel, and he even refers to Daniel as a prophet. That's why, you know, the early Hebrews, they didn't classify Daniel with the prophetic writings. They just connect, connected him with like the wisdom literature of the Old Testament. But when Jesus came along, he said, yeah, Daniel the prophet. And then Paul, the apostle Paul believed in Daniel. In 1 Corinthians 6, 2, he refers to Daniel. Not by, necessarily by name, but he has references to the book of Daniel. 2 Thessalonians 2, 3. 2 Timothy 4.17, and then the author of Hebrews in chapter 11.33 refers to Daniel, and even Peter in 1 Peter 1.10 refers to Daniel, and so not necessarily, like I said, by, by name do they refer to Daniel, but they are using quotes from the book of Daniel itself, and that's kind of like how the book of Revelation used the Old Testament. It didn't do direct quotes, but stuff it introduced, ideas it introduced were pulled straight out of the Old Testament. So there was really no question. You know, Alexander the Great believed the book of Daniel. When Alexander the Great was in the midst of conquering the entire known world, somebody showed him himself in prophecy in the book of Daniel. Yeah, and that's actually there's uh, a part in the book of Zechariah that was written during the time when um, it well it actually prophesied about the Alexander actually went to Jerusalem and he didn't destroy Jerusalem. He he actually met with the scribes and the Pharisees and he just passed through. It was, you know, and that's just one of those things people forget about historically. And so uh, John the Apostle believed in the book of Daniel because all through the book of Revelation, Daniel's all over it. So all you have to do is read Revelation and find out how much he got from Daniel. Um, and I wouldn't doubt when John wrote it, he, he pretty much had Daniel in mind because the visions he was receiving from, from God, it's like, oh, you already told us a lot of this stuff in the book of Daniel. So here we go. And then there's other external references to Daniel. E Ezekiel refers to Daniel no less than three times. Uh, Ezekiel 14, 14 and 20, and then in chapter 28, verse 3, he actually mentions Daniel by name. So that's another important thing to remember. So all we know about Daniel is this book. That's basically it. Now, Daniel was a common Jewish name, but... Daniel that was taken to Babylon, this is really the only place in the Old Testament, except for, like I said, in Ezekiel, that he's mentioned. There are two other Daniels named in the Bible, but they're not this one. And this is the only thing we know about this man is this book. So... If he didn't write this, then what's the use of forging something under his name? You know, and that's one of those things. Like they found what they call the um, agnostic gospels, where people actually did write some books, and they would say the gospel of Judas, something like that. It really wasn't Judas, but we know about Judas because of all his mention through the gospels. Daniel's not like this. He's, this is it. So there would be no reason for somebody to forge it. And this is kind of a nice little chart. You can kind of see where things started over there. The first invasion, there were actually three invasions. 
So that exile, 70 years, and Daniel was there for all of it. So that has been kind of an intro to my introduction. <laughs> so let's, let's just jump in here to a couple of verses. Chapter 1, 1 and 2. In the third year of the reign of King Jehoiakim of Judah, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand. Now that's an important part of a sentence. And that's why this just shows it's proof of the sovereignty of God. It wasn't anything that Nebuchadnezzar did. No, God just, okay, no, you're done as king, you're going. He was handed over to Nebuchadnezzar. Then it goes on with some of the vessels of the house of God, and he brought them to the land of Shinar. That's another important sentence. To the house of his God and placed the vessels in the treasury of his God. Now that's verified, though. Yes. Uh-huh. So first thing we see here, the this is basically the introduction to the book within the book. The first two verses. And so you just see names and places. And that's what we're introduced to first in the book. So two places, Judah and Babylon. And then two people, Jehoiakim and Nebuchadnezzar. And we're going to look into a lot more about Nebuchadnezzar here, how he came to power and what was going on in Babylon at that time. And he kind of had the same mindset of Alexander the Great. He wanted to teach their language and their religion to all the people that they conquered. And that's one reason why they would go in, they would take the best and the smartest and take them back with them. And then they would leave the farmers and the, you know, the people they didn't consider important yeah, the people of the land. <laughs> so, the land. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so basically what you're seeing here in those first two verses is a contrast. You could actually even call it an infinite contrast. Where did all a false human religion begin? Well, it began in Babylon, that area. That's where that word Shinar is important. And according to Revelation 17, all false human religion consummates there. So this is really an important, just two verses. So Babylon, the final form of evil. And so this was kind of an introduction to the world of this Babylonian idea. And the seat of God's throne then is in Judah. So there are our contrasts. You've got the throne that Christ is going to sit on when he comes back to earth. And then we've got Babylon, the seat of all false religion. And in a sense, they're both, they're, it's antithetical, being in direct and unequivocal opposition. And you hear people a lot of times throwing that word around, and I don't think they really know what it means. Um, but it, these are opposites. Yeah, surreal. Mm -hmm. So one, one of them, why they're so antithetical is one is Satan's place and one is God's place. And that's really all you need to know about it. It's, those are the two opposites. One is the promised land where the blessings flow. The other is the cursed land where flows all of evil spawned out of the terrible evil of Babylonian society originating where in the Tower of Babel. So that's that's what's kind of neat. Just here in two verses, you get this opposition. There's something else to bring it home today. <clears throat> Iran. Yeah. This close to taking over Iraq, which is where Babylon is. And the most evil people on the planet are in Iran right now. Yeah, Iran, Iraq, 
And actually, that was one of the weird things when we invaded over there. Um, Saddam Hussein was actually trying to rebuild the ancient site of Babylon. And in essence, this is poetic irony, like that statement there, nothing is written in stone. Yeah. <laughs> so you kind of think, well, how ironic is it that when God needed to punish his people, Israel, to purge them from their sin, he chose the most despicable, despised place on all the face of the earth. So you, you need to understand that the Jews, you know, like in Jesus's day, who, they, who did they despise? Well, Samaria, because that's where they thought all that despicable was. Well, in Daniel's time, it would have been the Babylonians. It, this would have been just hard for them to swallow. And it, But this is what God's doing. Like he said, God gave over Jehoiakim to Nebuchadnezzar. And it's just the place where evil idolatry originated. So that's the irony of the whole thing. Is it like thinking you're going to heaven that you're going to hell? <laughs> yeah, yeah, kind of like that, yep. Yeah. So let's look at Judah first. Okay, just to put it all into context, Judah was the southern kingdom after Solomon. It was comprised of two tribes, Judah and Benjamin. And after Solomon, it was Solomon's sons who succeeded in ripping the land in half. Um, so you had Judah in the south and Israel in the north. The 10 tribes took the north and Judah was just Judah and Benjamin. Um, so yeah, the the division of the two kingdoms after Solomon, it split, and that was about 925 BC, and it basically kind of was a civil war. Judah controlled the south, uh, Ephraim controlled the north, and that's why you will see in a lot of the minor prophets, Israel is referred to as Ephraim. So. Um, after 925, the Bible switches back and forth between the titles Ephraim and Israel. So anytime you'll see that, in, especially in the Minor Prophets, it's talking about the Northern Kingdom. <laughs> now, back to Judah. The, these two tribes continued kind of faithfully to God. Kind of, for a while. You know, there was a group, and I'm sure Daniel was probably part of this group in Jerusalem that were trying to be faithful. And so the southern kingdom existed until its captivity. So um, for 350 years, Judah existed with 19 kings, 19 different kings. So you can see the list there. Rehoboam is where it started, and that was one of Solomon's sons. Eight were good and 11 were wicked. And of those that were considered good, they were eh, kind of good, really good, you know, back and forth. So th this is kind of a nice little list. Um, and Jehoiakim was actually considered one of the most wicked. So you can kind of understand why at this point God chose, okay, boom, it's time to start this purging of the nation of Judah. And now a little side note, the northern kingdom, the ten tribes, never had one good king, never. All of them were rotten to the core. They were evil. And that's why the northern kingdom went into captivity before the southern kingdom. Now the northern kingdom never returned. And that's one of the interesting thing with the Jews returning to Israel now. They don't really know what tribe they belonged to because all the records were destroyed in 70 AD when the Romans burnt the temple. And so it's like the Northern Kingdom is in a continuous diaspora. Well, can I ask a question? If a Jewish person tells you that, oh, they're such and such a tribe, are they just guessing or deciding that by themselves? 
<laughs> they would have to have a pretty exact lineage somewhere, but I think they're just guessing. Because that's one thing that was kept in the temple was the lineage of all the different people, all the different kings, all the different tribes, where they settled, what they did. So I understand now that they're, I don't know how they do it, but they're showing by DNA, you know, that they're claiming they can know pretty much which tribe. Now, I don't know where they got the DNA from. The well, yeah, yeah, I've read uh, there's this biblical archaeology site. And they've actually uncovered some stuff where they've pulled some ancient DNA off of different things. But still, I kind of wonder, well, how do they know who it belonged to? You know, it's, yeah. DNA is DNA, but you got to have something to compare it to. That's right, you know. And if you don't have that source, you know, you can, you know, you can find it, but you're just guessing. And I think that's the bottom line. They're just so guessing. They, they, Tribes, they can tell you if you're Indian, but they can't tell you what tribe you're from. Right. Can I talk a little bit more about that? The written documents. Of yeah. I think that in that period of time in the Fertile Crescent, <clears throat> no other peoples kept records like that. The closest were the Sumerian. Yeah. And so that's why that we are so definite about Jesus and his heritage is because the records are still there. Well, and that's, that's a good point because people always wonder why are there so many lists of people in the Bible? Well, that's why. I mean, that's one of the things the Jews did. They kept great records. They had their lineages drawn out. And that's why we can look just looking at the Bible. We know where Jesus came from. It's real easy to connect the dots. Okay, so now we're going to look at the Babylonian Empire. And it's also called the land of Shinar. And that the first mention was Genesis 11:2, And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar and they dwelt there. So the land of Shinar, we saw that in verse two of Daniel. So that right there adds some credence to the authenticity of Daniel. It's actually starting right off the bat, quoting from the book of Genesis. Um, and this is simply an ancient name for Babylonia and that's what, kind of how they're designated historically. And it's also mentioned again in Genesis, a couple other places. It's called the land of Shinar. We know it now as Babylon, Babylonia. And I think he uses the old name in verse two to point out the ancient heritage of wickedness. And so that right off the bat sets up our juxtaposition of the two lands. Yeah. Yeah. Right about where the queue in Iraq is, is where Saddam Hussein was rebuilding mm -hmm. Babylon. Yeah, and they actually had, uh, I think it was actually Newsweek magazine went over there in like 1990 and attended some big ball that Saddam Hussein had at that location. You know, he rebuilt those blue gates with the lions on it. Um, and actually, I think they had a whole. The Ishtar Gate. Yeah, the Ishtar Gate. There you go. Well, I think I remember that uh, the land of Shinar is that uh, that name for Satan that starts with the N that means like the shining one. Oh yeah, Nahar, 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 and they say something like that, which is the shining ones. And that, that's an interesting point, because if you remember when time of Moses, Israelites were um, attacked by a plague from God. He made the bronze serpent, held them up, look at it, you know, and then later Christ said, you know, 
I must be raised up. You know, he compared himself to that. Well, what's interesting with that is Israel held on to that bronze serpent, and they actually started worshiping it later on. And uh, one of the good kings of Judah destroyed it. <laughs> so. The Shinar is like Satan. Yeah, and it is. It's a direct reference. You start looking at the old Tower of Babel and all the different words, and what has made that possible is archaeology because they uncovered all those cuneiform tablets, the 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 round thing. Um, yeah, well, they there's actually they would write on these cylinders like thing, and it would just go in a circle, and they really didn't get it translated until actually I think early in the 20th century. So. Um, that's another reason why the book of Daniel was being poo-pooed. But when they started finding all that archaeological stuff, oh, there, Daniel was even mentioned on those circular rolls. So. Wasn't there a Rosetta stone found in Egypt somewhere? Mm -hmm. And that's how they, they had these canisters with all the writing, Sumerian writing on it. They didn't know what it meant. But they found that Rosetta stone. Yeah, yep. And then Babylon's territory is basically what is called in the Bible ancient Mesopotamia, that whole area, uh, covered the lower part of that area. So there's a shot of it right there. Um, so when the Babylon, Babylonian Empire came, it swept to the north, took over everything there, but originally it had to do with the lower parts but by the time we arrive in Daniel's day, it had swept north, wiped out everything, came all the way west to the north of Israel, all the way down the coast, and then taken over all that territory, and it, they swept on into Egypt. They just kind of, and people don't realize historically Egypt, it mainly just existed along the Nile. There was nothing east or west of the Nile. So Babylon actually went way down the Nile and took over all of that territory. So it really did at that time rule the known world. And then in the area of that was the, of the Babylonian empire was this special area of Babylonia. And in the middle was Babylon. And that's the name that just keeps popping up all throughout the Bible. And it is significant because it's always pointing to something of evil. Now, Babylon was a capital city located on the Euphrates River, approximately 50 miles south of modern Baghdad. And by the way, within the city of Babylon, there were 50, at least 50 different temples to 50 different gods. So that's important to know they they were polytheistic but their number one god was the god named Marduk and it's most likely that when Nebuchadnezzar in verse 2 took the stuff from the temple in Jerusalem that's probably where it went he was their main main god and it's mentioned all over the archaeological stuff they've uncovered too so that was basically the treasure house of Nebuchadnezzar, the god Marduk. And it was really, you know, for its time, you know, we, well, as C.S. Lewis states, we participate in chronological snobbery. <laughs> we think we're so much better now than people were in the but when they started looking and digging up all this stuff around Babylon, they were really an advanced civilization. They had dug canals all around, and that's, you know, castles. They called them moats, but these were actually canals. They could travel boats around the city. Um, really complex system of, of canals and dikes. Yeah, yeah. Except for irrigation, too. Well, yeah, irrigation. I mean, they were, they, 
that's why they the one reason they, it's called the fertile crescent you know they, they had that source of water continual flowing water and they made use of it so now we need to look at the historical period in the third year of the reign of jehoiakim king of judah came nebuchadnezzar so that's where it all starts we know in the third year of the reign of jehoiakim so it's very specific time reference and immediately that's where another critic attack comes in I'll tell you why here they they say oh it's contradicting jeremiah what jeremiah said in jeremiah 21 5 the word that came to jeremiah concerning all the people of judah in the fourth year of jehoiakim son of josiah king of judah so a lot of people point to that and say, well, that proves the Bible contradicts itself. Jeremiah says the fourth year, Daniel says the third year. And if they can't even get that straight, how could they be trusted in anything else? And you, you find this, this kind of logic going on all the time in people who are trying to disprove the Bible. And you might wonder, well, what's the deal? Well. Critics say what they want to say for their own purposes. And it's usually because they do not dig any deeper. Jeremiah simply used Hebrew dating. Lunar calendar. And Daniel used Babylonian dating. The, the Babylonians never assumed that the first year of any king was to be considered in his reign. It was isolated from every other year. And according to Babylonian chronology, what that was his ascension to the throne. They would just call it his ascension year. <clears throat> so they didn't really even count it. And it was not counted among any of their kings. They found all these, um, again, more stones and clay tablets where they had all this, and that's actually one of their calendars, how they kept time in Babylon. But at least they agreed on one thing. They agreed that the king of Judah was taken over by the king of well, Babylon, and yet they argue about a date. Uh, well, yeah. <laughs> And then, but that's what I'm saying. They they take it superficially, yeah. just yank it out just and just say, oh, oh, yeah, it's it's wrong. This says three. This one says four. Well, wait a minute. You know, people do things different. And sure enough, Hebrew calendar added an extra year to it because they counted the years real specifically. And again, that's a kind of goes back to the tribal records and stuff of Judah. They were sticklers for exactness. That's interesting. That, that calendar looks a lot like what you find in Central America, the circular calendar. Well, and that's that idea of the sundial and all that stuff. It, it, that's that <laughs> same type of thing. So actually, we know all that from archaeology. And Daniel, living in a Babylonian society, would use babylonian chronology and one thing that people also forget from the time of daniel on the language that pretty much overtook um israel then was aramaic and it was based in this babylonian dialect well yeah well that, that's a good point too <laughs> So this doesn't disprove the authenticity of the Bible. It simply reinforces its absolute accuracy. Daniel would never contradict Jeremiah anyway, because in Daniel 9, verse 2, he indicate, indicated that he had Jeremiah's prophecies in his mind when he was writing. And he actually had copies of Jeremiah's writings in Babylon. <laughs> <laughs> so, sorry, you know, and here it is, verse 9-2. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, observed in the books the number of the years 
which was revealed as the word of the Lord to Jeremiah the prophet for the completion of the desolations of Jerusalem, namely 70 years. So it would be pretty dumb if he contradicted Jeremiah. Daniel simply writes in a Babylonian context. And that's what we need to understand. He was a Babylonian politician, basically. And he was so good that he was raised up to almost the top. So that makes sense. And what's interesting about that in Jeremiah chapter 29, God told Jeremiah, thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon, build houses and live in them, plant gardens and eat their produce. Take wives and have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there and do not decrease. But seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf. For in its welfare, you will find your welfare. That's basically what Daniel was doing. He was seeking the welfare of the city of Babylon. And you know that's good advice for us today. It is. It's and actually that's, you know, we know we're not we're citizens of heaven. So we need to seek the welfare of this world we're living in. <laughs> Whether we agree with it or not, you know, it's it's just it's pretty simple when you get down to it. And so next up, we'll look at the history and see some of that. We'll stop right there. So, um, good start.